please join me in welcoming Professor Bolzner. Thank you, Nan. It's a, a pleasure, a real pleasure to be here. So um, welcome to this building. We are sitting right there. So if you look at this block as a museum of change, uh, many things begin to unfold. There's the current block. It was, it was not easy getting this out of the ground. So we're sitting right here. Look around you. This is where you're sitting. I want you to be very present with where you're sitting. And this building, which is a library, and this is now part of Library Square, um, was once that horrible concrete jungle. Museums of change. You know, when Nan asked us if uh, we would come and make these presentations to uh, audiences uh, in Salt Lake, it was because she saw in our resumes that we speak out of town all the time. We were invited to uh, speak in other cities. And so as I was trying to think of what to do tonight, you know, there are many different lectures here. Uh, there's, a, there's a lecture about urban design, there's a lecture about Envision Utah, there's a lecture about a number of different things. This is sort of a Whitman sampler of the kinds of things I'm invited to talk about, but here's one that I'm invited to talk about around the world, and this is when we found the old Echo Browning warehouse which was built in 1910 to get the farmers off of Main Street because the farmers were uh, parking their wagons in front of the burgeoning financial district. And the Eccles and the Brownies didn't really like that, so they tried to build this uh, farmer's market uh, down on Piermont <coughs> Avenue. And as an artist coming back to Salt Lake City, what I needed to do was find affordable housing and workspace, and I couldn't find any, so I found this stunningly beautiful building. But as museums of change go, we couldn't really do that project legally because there was no zoning that would allow for live workspace or mixed use space on that side of town. It was zoned, zoned commercial, it was zoned uh, manufacturing, so we had to work through the city to create a new ordinance. So back in uh, 19, uh, 1980, we created a, a zoning ordinance with the help of the city to create uh, uh, the, the, the allowance that we could actually have with workspace there, that we could actually live in that part of town, and that they would be walkable urban neighborhoods. So 30 years ago, walkable urban neighborhoods was an innovative idea. And talk about a species that sort of lost their way. You know, birds fly, fish swim, people walk. But all of a sudden, we have to have books about walkable cities. And we were creating social spaces. Mr. Goldsmith, why would you possibly want to build housing down in that part of town? It's the highest crime area in the state of Utah. It's the highest poverty area in the state of Utah. Why would you want to be doing that? Well, we were doing it because we, we liked the area. We needed that unique kind of housing typology. We were also creating these fantastic new social spaces. We, were even using, we weren't even using the vocabulary of social spaces at the time. But over, over a period of time, as we restored that area, what happened was, that it became social space for other people who would call us and say, can we have a wedding there? Can we have a retirement party there? Many of you who I see here tonight actually were at parties in the back of that building. And a waiting list began to grow with other people who wanted to live in this neighborhood. So we found another great building across the street, a beautiful, isn't that a beautiful building? So we began to dismantle that building brick by brick and created these beautiful Edward Hopper landscapes. We reframed the landscape of the city and created affordable housing for 53 families who lived in that building. Waiting lists continue to grow. This is across the street from the shelter. And before the gateway was a gleam in the eye of um, uh, Roger Boyer and his partners, we began to very quietly acquire these properties and turn it into what is now the Bridge Project. And on one of my many trips to Freiburg, Germany, one of the things I discovered were all of these relationships to our city. So one of the things that I found there um, was this fantastic intermodal hub. This is a bicycle garage. Holds about 3,000 bicycles. This is a bridge, a pedestrian bridge. These are the um, lines that go to various parts of Germany, and some are intermodal as well. You can see uh, Red Butte up here, right? The similarities are, are really quite, quite remarkable. So when I saw this, we were negotiating the Interval Hub for uh, Salt Lake City. 
which is now down on uh, uh, 600 West. And I said, you know, why are we putting it there? And I was working with my colleague, Roger Bordovich, who's here tonight to talk about relationships. There are a lot of relationships in this room. We were trying to see if we could get the Intermodal Hub to actually exist at the UP Depot or exist at the Rio Grande Depot. But the policymakers said, well, Mr. Goldsmith, how are you going to possibly get the trains to the station? You look at me like I'm crazy. How are you going to get the train? These station stations have been here for 100 years. The trains have been coming to the stations. But no, we have an intermodal, intermodal hub now on 600 West. And what's scary about that is that two weeks ago, a representative from the RDA came to me and said, we don't know what we're going to do with this intermodal hub. It's just not working. When I got back from this trip, I was the planning director at the time. I presented that drawing to uh, a few people at uh, Utah Transit Authority. I said, you know, it reminds me a little bit of South of North Temple. Let me back up. It's a little like North Temple. What if, what if at North Temple, we were to create a, create a similar situation? We have a stair that comes down to connect people to Front Runner. We have light rail that can go across, and we have all the activity at Gateway. And they looked at me and they said that I was crazy. I'm used to this. I'm very used to this. But when they actually had the groundbreaking for rebuilding the bridge, they announced that this is what they're building. And it was announced that when Mr. Goldsmith was in Freiburg and he brought these uh, images to us and we told him we were, he was crazy, and here we are breaking down the uh, bridge and that's what they're building. And in about 13 months, that's going to be open. And it completely resembles that magnificent interface that was there. So the reason that I'm looking at this as a museum of change, it's almost like we're importing exhibitions from other places. This was an exhibition, if you will, in Freiburg, and it translated beautifully here. This is going up South Temple in 2005. I want you to look at this fine street wall we built in this town only 25 years before. Isn't that a gorgeous, stunning street wall? South Temple, the iconic street of our city, just yards from the 100% corner of our town. But this is the street wall that used to be there. Those are historic photos of Main Street and South Temple street walls. Scores and scores of doors to that block, which the planners decided back in the, in the 70s should be, 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 be turned into three openings, a South Temple opening, a Main Street opening, and a West Temple opening to get into the mall. That was it. Those are what the ex that's what the experts suggested that we did, and that's what the experts led the city leaders to do. I said, you know, we can have a couple of openings, some mid-block openings from West Temple to Main Street, reopen Richard Street, which had been closed many years before, take Richard Street all the way down to Gallup and Plaza so we'd have just a beautiful, beautiful view of the uh, gorgeous gardens at the LDS Church office building. We can really raise the bar high and suggest a different kind of uh, urban form for the downtown. And I remember when I told Rafi that I was going to hire the architect to do this, he looked at me, and I remember sitting in his office, he said, Stephen, what are you smoking? You think that they're going to actually tear down that building? It's only 25 years old. Go back to your office and regulate something. He was joking. He didn't hire me to be a regulator. But I went up to him and said, Rocky, I said, Rocky, I'm going to do this anyway. I've got a little bit of money in my budget. We can show the kinds of connections that are possible. We can show how you might be able to place a Nordstrom retail here across from the uh, convention center that sees millions of people every year. What, what uh, retailer doesn't want that exposure? We can also have a way that they can enter north from the church office, from, from the church grounds. What retailer doesn't want that exposure? Let's just show this. So let's start to show some housing on the block. Again, these were very crude drawings. We didn't have much money. Um, it's much more sophisticated now to illustrate these things than it was even uh, 13 years ago, 12 years ago. We showed the view of Reg Regent Street. We showed how the street could be used as a place for gathering. Showed the view from Temple Square across to Regent Street. And the whole purpose of this was to go over and have a conversation with the presiding bishop, David Burton. So I called Bishop Burton, with whom I had worked many times. I had a long relationship with him. 
had a long relationship from the time we did the regional urban design assistance team where you talk about all kinds of issues downtown like mixed use development and housing downtown. I remember one day that uh, we were having a, a little argument, David and I, about housing downtown. He said, you know, it's fine on the west side of downtown, like Third West, but the, the center of this town is for commerce and culture, Mr. Goldsmith. This is, this is for commerce and culture. I said, well, there's, there's a way to keep people downtown. That's if they're living downtown. So we might want to consider the possibility of housing. Of housing. So museums have changed. We all know what's coming out of the ground right now. We all know that the facadectomy that went along with the uh, VCMI building is now a real building again. Those floor plates are real floor plates. So museums have changed. That's a parking lot that uh, once had a car wash in it. By now you know how I feel about cars. Um, over time and over negotiations with city leaders, we were able to take that parking lot and turn it into what is now City Creek Park to restore the habitat that was once there when this valley was so a little less of a cultural landscape. We were able to create all kinds of gatherings for people. And there's a little story about how you do this work because it's about negotiation. This is uh, what's called Fireman's Hill. How many of you are familiar with Fireman's Hill up in uh, Memory Grove? This is Fireman's Hill. And it was just a grassy area. When the city decided to daylight City Creek, they said they wanted the water exposed as much as they could possibly expose it all the way down into the valley and as far as we could get it was State Street. But the neighbors who lived over here including uh, Mayor Becker at the time, were very opposed to this project because who would want water running down next to their house? Now, I recall looking at magazines like Town & Country or any architectural magazine or a travel magazine. One of the things that I always see is that the most expensive houses are the ones near the water. And people also like the sound of water. So through a series of negotiations, trying to make sure we had some water there uh, led to creating an incision in Fireman's Hill, creating a rubble that just had a little bit of City Creek water that was there so people who could move away from the house. If they're, walk if they're walking up the street, they're moving away from the houses. It's, just, it's, it's, like, it's like a visual cue, people moving away from the houses rather than close to the houses. We had to do this as a fast-track fast job because Mayor Corradini, who was, the, who was wanting to get this done at the time, wanted it done before the election. And trying to fast track a job, daylight a creek, is not the way you want to daylight a creek, especially when a little bidder for the job is a, a, a company named Peter Kiewit, who are road builders. Peter Kiewit came in to build the freeway for the Olympics, and they needed to get a, a landing spot here. So they built this, um, so they, they restored City Creek using road building equipment. The only reason I'm telling you this story is as, as a urban relativist, the kinds of tools we use to do these things right, very, very important. If we enter this over again, who knows what we might be able to do. But this is now a successful project, and even though the neighbors across the street were opposed to it, now they have welcomed it. Now, let me just finish with this. We make choices about how our cities change. We have, the, we have the great luxury of making choices, but in New Orleans, they didn't have that choice. This is the Ninth Ward. The photograph that I took of the Ninth Ward, and I went there with a number of students about three months after Katrina. And a colleague of mine, Janine Benyus, uh, who wrote the book Biomimicry, had looked at this area as well, and she came there with this, she was trying to figure out is why is it that 95% of the trees in New Orleans, the live oak trees, the live oak trees, just that one species survived in New Orleans after Katrina, and all the other species perished. So what she told us was that uh, these trees had adapted, these trees had adjusted just like we do. I just saw somebody scratch their head. We're always adjusting, and these trees have adjusted over the millennia to understand what it's like when a hurricane comes. So when a hurricane comes, the leaves roll over to resist the resistance to the wind. When the wind gets really bad, these trees have what are called sacrificial limbs, and the limbs will break off to give the tree a greater understanding, a greater knowledge, a greater chance of survival. When the winds get really, really bad, one of the things that makes uh, live oak trees so magnificent that they grow in clusters, they grow in communities. 
and their roots are tied together below ground, and they're wrapped around each other as a system, as a community, and as a family. So when the wind gets really hard, and one big tree begins to fall, the other trees hold the others up. And so what I'm leaving you with tonight is a sense of uh, what I've seen. The book, What We See, that Nan Allen has a chapter in is a way of exploring the way that we advance ideas and the way that we advance the opportunities by truly listening to the places that we care about. And this book, Ideas That Matter, which is the story of Jane Jacobs, is, a, is another recently published book that I encourage you to put your eyes on because it's about ideas that matter. It's not about celebrating Jane Jacobs. It's not about looking backwards. It's about leaning forward into our time and wondering how we might reclaim our places. Thank you.